What's up, everyone, and welcome to Movie Emporium's TV review of Snowpiercer Season 1, Episode 5, Justice Never Boarded. Uh, before we begin, please hit that subscribe button to join Movie Emporium, hit that notification bell top to find out coming next, and uh, comment below on any videos you watch, including this one. So, once again, that was a great episode. That was a fantastically paced, well-executed, very tense episode because you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Yes, LJ is on trial. Yes, they are, you know, the first class is very influential with Wilford and, of course, Melanie. But Melanie seems to have a good head on her shoulders and she's going to surpass the idea of what first class needs and the parents of LJ and so on and so forth. And LJ's parents are very like, we have a lot of money. It's the same thing with all the other first class passengers. We have all this money and we want all our people on uh, as the jury and blah, blah, blah. And Miss Audrey comes into effect. She has a picture of Nikki. And I like the idea that it's seeming like Miss Audrey almost took care of Nikki. Like it was her child. It actually could have been her child. And she's so heartbroken about what's going on. So she kind of forces Melanie to bring in the other classes, the second and third class, to give it a more fair trial, to give Nikki the representation that she never has gotten throughout her life, how she was basically, you know, falsified as a criminal and stuff like that and put in the drawer. And that is a really powerful thing because the idea of bringing in the second and third class to kind of envelop with the first class who does nothing, wants nothing to do with these other classes, even though, as Miss Audrey says, the third class is the most important class because they take care of the whims and needs of every other class. First class gets all the benefits. Third class has to deal with the crap of like making sure the train runs, making sure the sanitation runs, making sure all these things run. And I really like that idea. I really like that it's a fascinating look into the kind of mind psychology of this train situation of Snowpiercer itself. And I know a lot of people will be upset by me talking about this, but this episode is, even though it was filmed months ago, maybe a year ago, depending on when they actually filmed this, uh, this whole entire series or this season, it's very prescient about what's going on in today's society with the fact of the lower class is being looked down upon. The people are worried that, you know, the certain subset and certain subtext are going to have their, you know, wins and days in court. And they're not going to be the second and cl third class are not going to be listened to. And they're not going to be given the opportunity to not feel like they're criminalized because LJ is clearly, clearly manipulating everything. Thanks to her parents. You can tell she's faking everything because the way she acts, the way she talks to Roche and is trying to manipulate him into talking, the way she fakes her tears, she just goes on and on. And what's so nice about bringing that second and third class in with the first class juror is they see right through her lies. They see that she is fake. She is false. She is not. She's a messed up individual. And that is a beautiful thing to watch. And that's why I like this episode so much is because the second and third class are able to give their voice and it really plays well. And the fact that LJ was convicted is insane to think about and kind of kind of nice because, you know, that doesn't happen. But LJ does the one thing that, of course, Melanie realizes that becomes a problem is she knows the information about what they're doing with the drawers, which becomes a big revelation in this episode. But, of course... You know, Melanie now knows she has to put in a play about having Wilford basically uh, give her a combination, give her, you know, amnesty, let her go free. So LJ is let free. It causes variety, of course, in the second and third classes. Basically, everything goes back to status quo for the, the episode. And you see how LJ is kind of manipulating Melanie at the very end of this episode. And it's just a very, very interesting thing to see because... It doesn't matter what people do or how they act. It could be this century. It could be that century. It could be this decade. It could be that decade. It could be everything that you can think about. Nothing seems to want to change. And that was what is this episode is trying to say. Is it doesn't matter if it's 1995. It doesn't matter if it's 2020. It doesn't matter whatever century this series takes place. People are going to try to manipulate the system and they're going to use every means possible to manipulate that product. And when we see it happen to Melanie, when she goes, oh, crap, I know what's going on. She realizes what she has to do. LJ, I guarantee you, is going to have something happen to her at the end of the this, this season where there, she's finally going to get her come up, come up and stuff like that. But right now, her 
status goes back to the same, but Melanie will always have the upper hand and how everything plays out. So I really did enjoy that. I really enjoyed the trial and the you know idea set forth. I like what Miss Audrey was saying and how passionate it was was. I like the I like the level of what LJ is doing in this episode. You know, Annalise Basso, who plays LJ, is gone from just a stereotypical rich young girl to being this menacing individual. And she plays so well off her her parents. She plays so well off Melanie. I think it's a really good performance that has turned into a like a next level tier enemy slash villain style character. And it's gonna be really interesting to see what they do with her as the story moves along. So we're goes from there i don't know but we'll see what happens it was a very interesting episode dealing with that you know courtroom drama but dealing with the train situation the next thing i'll talk about is we have bess and genju who are a couple in the series a very awesome couple they finally have gotten to the level where bess is now a second class citizen they now live together it's a very sweet moment at the very beginning of this episode it really you can really feel a passion between the two but the funny thing about about this segment is i knew where it was going to go because when you have something that good happen in a series where everything just seems to be on edge and going wrong and going crazy the very end of the segment which i'll get into when i talk about that other portion of this episode she notices you know uh the door to the drawers open and she realizes Josie's in there with trying to, you know, take Andre Layton. Why is Bess doesn't understand why Andre's in the in the drawers? So she actually uh, hits John in the head, which causes even more problems for her because you know this is going to have a ripple effect when the next episodes come on, when she, the, it goes later into the season, where she's going to have to pay the price for beating him over the head with the fact that he was trying to stop this woman from taking Andrew Layton, which is going to lead into a whole bunch of problems maybe re revocation from her second class citizen maybe go to jail who knows what's going to happen who knows if john's actually going to protect her you know maybe she forgave him for what he was doing to the the tail class to give him medicine i don't know but it, it leads into a oh i can kind of see this coming because it's a such a sweet moment for a very bleak series so that's all best really had to do in this episode is just become that second class is and, and then go, Oh crap. My revocation is probably going to happen depending on how it goes. So, I mean, the next week's apparently train derailing type of stuff, which I was kind of predicting would happen at the end of the season, not, you know, sixth episode. So there you go. So kind of the B plot in this episode is Josie figuring out what happened to Andrew Layton, trying to figure out why he disappeared. The fact that he's only in the drawer for one episode is a little disappointing. I kind of wish it would have you know, gone into another episode, but we see her exchanging clothes with, I think it was her sister. Uh, she goes out, she saw that chip in her hand. And with the help of Terrence, who is the janitor we saw in a couple of episodes prior as the kind of warlord type guy, they go and they break into the drawer room. Happy Anderson has gone off to watch the trial, watch the verdict, all that good stuff. And she is in a in a panic because she doesn't know where he's you know where he's located because he could be any number of these drawers but she wants help but she realizes terrence and the lady that she, he is helping her just want to buy a bunch of medicine and stuff like that or you know drugs or whatever they're going to use it for so she eventually finds andrew layton but in the process she opens up all these drawers and it's different people she knows all these people from kids to adults to these you know young individuals are in this drawer which is going to lead up into a very big revelation of why are these people in this drawer yes the three guys that i think the three yeah three guys from the beginning and the tail car were put in the drawers but when we find out melanie is hiring a secret about why they have these drawers in the first place about the fact that they're using experiments maybe who knows what's going on what why it's happening i don't know but she basically pulls andrew layton kind of stupidly out of the drawer he could have died, he could have an embolism. We're starting to learn that the effects of the drawer are something that Nikki may have not recovered from, which is a really interesting kind of look into what possibly we could be experiments and stuff like that. So it's really interesting to see that's how LJ was able to get out of the out of being convicted. That's how, you know, we find out that there's people being hidden in the drawers. And I'm really interested to see how later on this is going to affect the storyline is the revelation of what melanie is doing how she's experimenting how what is she doing 
I'm really kind of interested. I'm really fascinated because it brings up a whole new plot scenario that completely throws the Snowpiercer killer out the window. No more of that. It's going to be interesting to see how this works, how this plays out. We get to see, like I said, Andrew Layden having dreams, having uh, very vivid memories, I guess. I don't know if it's a memory or it's actually a dream or it's fake or it's not a fake reality or whatever it is. Maybe that's another thing that I'm not thinking about because he's having these weird, vivid dreams or memories or whatever. And the fact that they were cannibals, so he's like cutting up hearts and stuff like that. It's really, really disturbing. They're eating. They're saying no more cannibalism. So... Does that mean the tail section were cannibals for the longest time? Is he part of this cannibalism? I mean, I don't know. Or is this like an implant total recall situation where Melanie and them are putting like fake memories into him to kind of suppress things, to kind of make people different, to kind of put people into a different state of uh, well, awakening? I mean, I don't know what's going on. Maybe that's why Melanie was trying to suppress Andrew to kind of keep him in line and check so that he wouldn't leave and go off to the tail section because he's an important investigator. I mean, I don't know. It's really fascinating to see what Melanie is harboring as not only Wilford, but as, you know, the kind of the conductor of the train and all these secrets that are starting to, to become like revelations in small bits and pieces. So we're just at the cusp of what is truly going on in this train from Melanie's perspective. But from what we've seen with Melanie, she is not 100% on the level and people know that and they're going to express that and do whatever they need to but overall yeah it's gonna be really interesting to see what does what does drawers entail how each character that pops up in this series becomes more and more important to the overarching scenario of the story so it's really fascinating i'm really enjoying it um this is like i said it's another fantastic episode that does a lot like i said with you know it's 45 50 minute, 50 minute runtime, so I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. Um, it was, you know, not the most perfect episode because of the visual effects, but 9 out of 10 is a pretty good episode. So so that'll do it. That'll be my take on Snowpiercer Season 1, Episode 5, Justice Never Boarded. Uh, let me know in the comments below what you think of the episode. Did you like it? Did you not like it? What was your favorite part? All that good stuff. Also, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you don't, hit the dislike button, depending on what you think. But otherwise, you know, uh, comment below, hit the notification button at the top to find out what's coming next, and subscribe to Movie Emporium, my channel. But otherwise, I'll see you guys on the next episode. Peace out. What's up, guys? Thank you so much for checking out Movie Emporium. I really appreciate it. If you want to, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification button and the bell at the top. Find out what's coming next for Movie Emporium. Also, check out these two videos. They're amazing. I think they're awesome. I think you'll enjoy them too. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.